Hi, I'm Ben Nolan from Shaparency, uh, and welcome to our webinar series. We're bringing you the best content on what's happening around the board, across the world, particularly in the not-for-profit sp not for profit space. And today we have Nigel Kipax from Charity Leaders and the Trustee Fellowship. Nigel, welcome. Thank you for your time. Why don't we start right there and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself mm. and what you're doing at uh, your company. Ben, good, good to meet. Thanks for the invitation. Um, very briefly, uh, <clears throat> just to put it into context, my background is very much corporate sector. I worked in petrochemicals for 15 years. I, was, I worked in strategy and operations consulting uh, for a number of years. Um, but for the last 15 years, I've focused entirely on the charity sector, not-for-profit sector. And, um, <clears throat> and the whole, the whole ethos of, of what, we're, what we're about is trying to transform and, and improve the effectiveness of charities. And I learned quite quickly, maybe could have learned it a little bit even more quickly, uh, that nothing happens in a charity unless you've got the board of trustees working effectively together, supporting the charity. So that's it gravitated to that. So the work with now is focused almost entirely with charity boards. Um, we, we, uh, we do board re reviews, governance reviews, run workshops for the char charity, um, charity trustees and the board. Uh, that leads us into coaching. It may also lead into interim management. Uh, great. And so when you say that uh, you know, nothing really happens within a charity if the board's not on, not on board, you know, and, and if, they don't have, if you don't have buy-in, what are some of those examples that that are, that are that are need to be led from the top down? Well, well, I think first of all, let, let's understand uh, what's different about the not-for-profit or the charity sector to a, to a corporate sector, because I think that that's there's a bit of insight there. Is that the the governance structure in charities, and when we're talking about those charities that that are large enough to employ uh, a senior team. So you've got a chief exec, you've got a board of directors. I'm not talking about charities that are 100% volunteers, okay? Mm. Um, but for those, those organizations, you have a, a, a governance structure where that chief, chief exec, full-time salary chief exec, works for a team of part-time volunteers. Now that's quite an unusual structure. And, um, and you can argue that maybe that structure isn't always fit for purpose, but maybe we don't go there. We have to live with what we've got. Um, and uh, and it's uh, and it's it's that relationship between an, a salaried individual and a part-time volunteer is absolutely critical to, uh, to to how that charity works. Superimpose on that uh, the the changes in the charity sector, particularly in the UK, uh, where more and more ex-government bodies are now becoming charities, uh, particularly in social care. Uh, uh, roles that were taken by social services are now taken by charities. But you've also got uh, organisations that are run by skills council or you know, government they're becoming charities. So there's a real, you know, some of these charities now are quite big, very big, mm -hmm. uh, but they still operate within that governance structure of chief exec reporting to part-time volunteers. So having the right mindset and getting those part-time volunteers to work effectively together understand mm. their role that is absolutely key and and that's what we're about and uh, and the and when we when we look at that it is a specific challenge uh, and uh, and 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 the, and there's a small number of common pitfalls that we see charities falling into and i think that's maybe the learning maybe the messages come out of understanding those um, those pitfalls well, that would that would actually be a great question. Is the one what I was going to ask next is what are those common pitfalls that you're finding these these organisations, these charities are falling into that they that you're helping them navigate? Yeah, I think the the top the the uh, the most the most common pitfalls I I, I group into into three headings is about rules, it's about risk, and it's about relationships. Okay, so take the first one of those rules. Um, one of the common pitfalls, and maybe it's something to do with part-time uh, volunteer, not having a lot of time to invest, um, but there is a, a tendency for trustees to focus on what I call management protocol and not recognise that the role of the trustee is actually a leadership role. 
So understanding that difference between management and leadership, whereas management is following the rules, following the protocol, leadership is making judgment calls within the context of your particular charity and the situation. And uh, and that is is a, is a different mindset. It's a very different challenge. Uh, I happen to believe that 80% of the trustee role is about leadership. But what I see is 80% of the trustees' activities is often on management protocol. And um, and 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 that's you know that common uh, pitfall um, is leads to uh, leads to boards you know just focusing on the rules and taking a a a distance approach between themselves and the executive. Often uh, it can lead to um, uh, avoiding some of the challenging decisions. It can lead to hiding behind rules and adopting what can be quite controlling uh, uh, type of uh, type of uh, interaction with uh, with the employed executive um, mm. <clears throat> there's some there's some really good work by Jim Collins actually um, a good to great famous so and he wrote a book mm. called um, called how the mighty fall and there he looks at uh, although it is focused on on corporate sector, I think there's a lot of uh, analogies here with the, with the charity sector, and he sees what the, the one of the biggest um, pitfalls of a board is hubris, and it's hubris in that area of of when you are growing and nothing can go wrong, and you only look at data that confirms uh, the uh, the you know this decision bias, and I think we see that within trust within, within boards uh, of boards that just assume they're right. Rather than rather than being prepared to question and uh, and say, well, mm. maybe we haven't got all the data. Maybe there's something else happening, and uh, so that's that area of rules um, mm. is is a is a key pitfall. So mm. you know that leads us to working with uh, working with individual trustees, working with boards to understand the difference between management and leadership decisions and the implication of that for how they make how this board makes decisions about the mm. future of the charity. There was, I mean, I've got a question there, but there's, there's a, one of the stats that I re rely on a lot when I'm talking to boards, and particularly when we talk around board performance and the need to start to adopt technology, is actually what you just alluded to around hubris. You know, there, there's two, two key things that I've come across over the last 12 months, and one of the latest reports uh from mckinsey the 2021 report on the state of the board um does actually refer to the, the de declining board performance is actually related to ego um largely um deloitte did a, a report in 2020 said 85 percent of uh non-execs think the person next to them is underperforming but never them <laughs> uh which comes out in like self-evaluation you know uh surveys so I find that really interesting, you know, that, that applies to, you know, the general state of the board. Do you think there's a particular reason, um, you know, or do you think this is particularly damaging to charities as they've got, you know, a unique particular set of circumstances with this relationship between the paid management, the volunteer potential trustee and, and this board? Do you think that that's particularly embedded um some dysfunction that that they really need to start to helicopter out of and navigate and that and that's one of the you know that's what you're referring to is it particularly <clears throat> exacerbated in the in the not-for-profit sector uh, uh i believe it is um and i think it's exacerbated if you look at the at the guidelines the rules and guidelines that are issued uh, for trustees and boards if you then look at the available support that's provided by various organisations, whether they be accountants or lawyers or what you know. These uh, there's a myriad of organisations that provide support to uh, uh, to boards. <clears throat> Almost all the support that's available for trustees focuses on what I would call the job description, mm. um, and it uh, focuses on the task. And this is what the rules are. This is what there uh, is, is is your job. And it's then very easy to fall into that trap of thinking right. This is my this is my job. I don't need to worry about the relationships. I don't mm. need to worry about the board dynamics. And it's okay to tell other people what to do. 
and I think mm. that's what we need to get out of. Um, we need to uh, we need to drive home uh, and keep driving it home that uh, the, the board of trustees, the volunteer trustees, and the and the paid executive are two sides of the same coin. They have to be seen as one team because the only reason those two boards exist and is the only it's reason because of both is stakeholders to, is to support the beneficiaries of the charity. That is mm. it. Without the beneficiaries, mm. then neither of those teams exist. So we need to break down those barriers of us and them. Uh, the mm. language we use, the systems we adopt, and uh, you know everything that drives that culture of us and them, we need to smash that away. Uh, we need to realise that actually there's a, there's two teams coming together that have to support the beneficiaries, and I think mm. it is particularly um, uh, different. It is different in the in the charity sector. Um, the the kind of people that get attracted to volunteer jobs are different. Um, it tends to be self-selecting for people who've got time in their hands. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. They may be very experienced, but they've got time. Well, you've got time because you probably haven't necessarily got mm. a day job. So that tends to self-select. And mm. uh, and but and I don't know. Maybe there's something about um, um, being in that situation of uh, of wanting to do it, wanting to fulfil the role without investing the time to build the relationships. This is not actually something that can be done just meeting for two hours every couple of months. Yeah, well, this sort of makes me, I was going to ask you a question I might, I might come back to around strategy and governance, but this sort of makes me jump to a, a broader theme of what we hear a fair bit about in the charity slash not-for-profit sector is, you know, it's hard to do X, because we've only got volunteers and that comes back to, you know, even the recruitment strategy. I mean, there's a broader trend across the corporate board that we're seeing and we're playing a role in, in terms of, you know, I think we're going through a generational shift around, uh, you know, we've been through a phase where boards have largely actually have generally self-selected, you know, you've got your mates on board, you know, there's a great stat out of the FTSE that talks about the average name in the FTSE board is, uh, I think, John and Adam or John and Steve or something. You know, there was one that came out of the Australian ASX that discussed that they worked out that of all their ASX 200, it was only sort of a couple of degrees of separation between all the different boards that largely uh, never went outside for an outside recruitment. And we've got to get away from that. I mean, yep. we're heading into an area of architecting the optimal board. Um, and you know it's going to go beyond more than just the the local indices or the local exchanges mandating that you do board performance it's going to boards are going to have to start to adopting better strategies in regards to their shareholders or stakeholders whatever they may be do you think that there's an excuse for the for the charity because of the volunteer uh you know as you say they're self-selecting because they've got time or do you think that charities need to step up um and actually say you know no we can still build a world-class board and and actually start adopting the same strategies that corporates are starting to do yeah i think the answer is it depends and um, if if you uh, if you are a very small local charity um uh, that doesn't employ anyone uh, and bear in mind this this represents over 90 percent of the entire number of charities in the uk right um, selecting friends and co uh, friends and colleagues and networks, I don't actually see a problem with that, because you need somebody to run that local village hall. You need somebody mm. to run this little, uh, you know, this this volunt voluntary out, out that. And I think maybe one of the one of the big problems with the sector is we tend to come up with these rules and guidelines and try and apply them for 160,000 charities in the UK. You can't mm. do that. And um, mm. so let's focus on those charities that do turn over a reasonable amount of money, do employ people. And um, within those, uh, these these charities are often using public money mm. and they might not be paid directly, but they're certainly paid through government contracts, local government contracts. And um, if they're not using public, mo uh, if they're not using uh, taxpayers money, they're using money that's donated to them. They mm. have a responsibility to use those funds to the best possible effect to, to meet the needs of the beneficiaries. And uh, mm. there is a moral responsibility. Um, and, uh, and so 
in my view, it is absolutely essential that, that uh, in that context, you don't just bring in your mates. Mm. Um, you are prepared to advertise more widely. Um, if you do, uh, you know, the problem, of course, is that if you if you if you if you just close the um, the scope of your recruitment, uh, you will almost certainly recruit in your own image. And uh, mm. you will then end up with a board that very often feel they work extremely well together because they don't mm. disagree. Mm. They have a similar mm. outlook. They have yeah. a similar outlook on life. They have similar life experiences. They have similar intellect, all the rest of it, similar uh, social, social backgrounds. And they think they get along very well. But actually, the, the diversity of that board, um, and we need to be careful about what we mean by diversity, because uh, that again, we need to put that into context. But that cognitive diversity, that yes. ability to look at a problem, a look at a challenge, and see it from a different perspective, that lacks. <clears throat> so what happens is the robustness of those board decisions are limited. Ah, mm. Right. Okay. So let's work back. Uh, it's all about the beneficiaries. You've mm. been given money. You are entrusted. You are a trustee. You are entrusted with the assets mm. of the charity. You know, uh, and for a limited time, we'll come back to that. Uh, but you are being entrusted with these assets. It is, uh, it is, um, it is up to you to make sure that the, the decisions you make regarding those assets are as robust as they poss can possibly be. That will not happen unless you have a variety of views around that board table, and that can't happen if the only way you're recruiting is phoning up your your mates and invite them to be the board right mm. that's the reason it's important it's not through some for me it's not through some kind of just um you know, ethereal isn't it nice to have diversity uh it's because this is a hard-nosed decision about using finances for the benefit of beneficiaries so you better make sure that your decisions uh, are as robust as possible so for example if you are of a charity that is servicing you know um uh, migrants how does the voice of the migrant get into that decision-making process? Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. that's that's the conversation that needs to go on. And uh, who's got the who's got the perspective of the end user? Who's got the perspective of the beneficiary that's been there and can talk and can contribute to those decisions? So I think all of that uh, says uh, says that the composition of the board is important. Therefore, the recruitment is important. And uh, therefore, where you search. <laughs> is important and there's the whole yes. that whole process needs to be, uh, and do you, needs to be addressed do, do you uh with what you do um around the board evaluation and and the consulting element do you do you see that the that boards have to start using more data and and um for one of a bit of a word you know creating you know you know a blueprint of what their ideal board looks like you know, and so therefore you're not just creating, you're not, you know, you're not, not singularly going out and, and, and saying, hey, we've, we've, we're meant to have a board of seven, someone just resigned, let's find a six person, you're taking it right back and saying, you know, you know, using the sporting analogy, like, okay, what's the ideal team look like, you know, you know, where's our, where's our skills, strengths and gaps. And, you know, it could mean that you go through a two or three year transition period to build this ideal board architect, if you will. Um, is that something that you talk to boards about? Like, and how, and I guess in, in, in a coupling with that, how progress, progressive are they on that type of conversation? Uh, you know, and, and you know, as in terms of how you're actually using data to drive their recruitment? I think, okay, so there, there seems to be two points there. Um, one, you talked about the size of the board. Um, and, uh, and, and I guess part of this ref, uh, goes back to you know, it's not just about the rules. If your constitution says you have to have a board of a minimum of five people, maximum of 12 people, um, then you know, and you've got a board of 12, uh, at some point you've got to ask, why do we need a board of 12? Mm. Is, is 12 the right number? Is five the right number? Is six? And, and you've got to be prepared to, uh, to, to say, well, actually, in this case, I need, you know, <laughs> in the same way that you would select um, uh, a, a team to run, to run a corporate, you know, what is the right size of, 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 uh, of people? And um, so just because that was right in the past does not mean it's right in the future. So, you know, come on, 
you know, be yeah. prepared to challenge that. Be prepared to challenge. And, uh, and and if it means rewriting the constitution, then rewrite it, yeah. because it's not about the constitution. It's not about the rules. It's how do you get the right people on the bus on the board to make the yeah. decisions for the benefit of the beneficiaries. So everything works back from the beneficiaries. So that was the, um, um, that, 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 that point's uh, worth making. That was about size of the board. The other, your other point was, was how progressive with, as you do your work, data. how progressed are they on using data to drive the <clears throat> shape, the composition of the board and how they recruit? Um, I'm not sure, actually, to be honest. I don't. I don't think that's a, 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 in terms of in terms of data on the board. The the, the area where I do see um, that uh, uh, things are improving and need to change further is is how uh, when it comes to board reports, papers provided to the board by the exec. Uh, you know how much how many of those boards use data in the most effective way. Yeah. Uh, that's a real issue and my background in in uh, in petrochemicals and in consulting a lot of that was in statistical analysis and yeah. uh, and and understanding trends and understanding you know how to how to cut that data in a way that actually tells a story that is definitely missing within uh, charity executives being able to um, being able to uh, put together a two page report that tells me exactly uh, what's working well, what isn't working well, as a trustee, when I see that, so what do I need to do differently? And there's mm. a story in there. And that, that, that's the often missing. That's, that's okay. uh, very often missing. Interesting. So, and, it gives me some ideas. Yeah. So uh, got a couple of questions left before we, uh, yeah. before we end. So the question that, sort of begs to mind as you've talked through you know what you guys do and what you see some of the challenges is you know i guess then what is what would be the you know the couple of trends that you'll see that that the the boards and the charities are going to go through over the next couple of years from a from a you know maybe from a, a performance perspective from a technology focus from a you know maybe even some of the things that they, you think they're going to have to navigate um, and prepare for. Okay, um, I think I'm going to go back to. Uh, I mentioned those three areas. Those three areas of common pitfalls. And we talked yeah. about the focus on rules. Uh, the other two were, were around risk and relationships. I think one of the areas um, is so. If we take risk uh, again, if we look at the guidance that's provided to charities, almost all of it. So it talks about um, about things like you know uh, risk avoidance risk mitigation uh, and with that assumption that all risk is bad and we need to try and you know eliminate it we need to we need to change that and that that comes from from data and understanding the organization because we need to understand that actually uh, nothing happens nothing grows without taking risk because you don't change anything without risk so and I think so preparing and getting the the risk register the risk analysis and recognizing that there's more than one category of risk uh, and some of it needs positive decision to take risks that's and that's something that a trend i think that's, that that uh, uh, needs to be understood <clears throat> and uh, and trustees and boards and and exec collectively uh, need to be bringing the data in to be able to make those judgment decisions to take risks in the same way that would you would in a corporate area if you're looking at a at a new business line a new source of income or yeah you know, that kind of thing so i think that that's an area and um, and the other the other area i mentioned was around relationships and uh, and that's and that's in in in, in two you know, let's look at that in uh, two levels there's the relationships within the board themselves so we we've, we've already talked about it being part-time volunteers uh, <clears throat> tend not to uh, see a great deal of each other. Very different from a, an operational team. Operational team tends to see each other every week, you know, maybe every day. Um, boards see themselves every two or three months. Mm. Um, so the temptation, and we see it again and again and again, is that uh, when, you, when you get into that boardroom, it's kind of, oh, yeah, we're all here, right. Major, uh, agenda topic is bomb, 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 because we've got a lot to get through. Mm. And, the, and we go straight into the task um, and we don't address the people issues, particularly those team inclusion issues. 
So people can sit there for for months, sometimes years, and not feel they actually know the person next to them and not feel able to contribute uh, to their uh, fullest capacity uh, because they've never really felt included in that board. And mm. uh, and you know if you look at any team, uh, and 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 it's I had a, had a very interesting conversation with a very senior trustee uh, just last week, and he kind of his, the, the light bulb came on. He went. He said, I've just realized I've had all these decades of senior executive experience and I come to this board meeting and I leave my brain at the door. <laughs> he said, I know this stuff. Why am I not using it inside this meeting? Uh, because we just focus straight into the task. And he recognized mm -hmm. that the strength of the board was a summation of those one-to-one -one relationships. So how much time is spent on those relationships? So I think over t uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's something that it's already in pro, but it needs to happen more, which is the board spending more time actually developing themselves as a team and focusing yeah. on board dynamics. So yeah. not just the task, but the board dynamics. And, yeah. uh, and if yeah. the board get that right, then of course the next step is, what about the dynamics between the board and the executive team? And yeah. treating that as one team, that that focus on on teaming, particularly team inclusion, uh, as yeah. part of that process of uh, team development, uh, that is something that um, uh, that I think is 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 a huge issue moving forward. And if we get that right, then so a lot many of, of the stuff other flows. Ab it just falls falls into place because then yeah. you know you don't get the hubris, uh, you don't get the arrogance. Uh, you mm, get, yeah. uh, you know, you start to get people understand. Well, actually, I don't understand that. Let's have that conversation, and uh, and uh, you know, then you then you 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 have a situation where everybody in that board is bringing everything they have to contribute to those decisions. So okay. those, uh, I think that's yeah. In terms of where last we're question, last question yeah. on a uh, on a on always a topical issue, and I I ask it because I'm somewhat not somewhat in the sense I am very passionate about it just in terms of the state of the board and the data that, that, that came out recently on, on the McKinsey report um, also suggested that it's it's heading downwards is, is diversity. And I get that there's multi, yep. multiple <clears throat> yep. categories of diversity. This is more of an opinion question and maybe maybe some, some from your own observation is largely what we see as, a, as an organization that sells to not-for-profits and charities all over the world, um, is the state of the board matches the statistics and that it is largely male yep largely white yep um and skills base uh is is largely homogenous right so mckinsey's report suggested that it's heading down in some ways uh in some areas of, of diversity uh in fact just recently i was reading an article on um the UK may have to look, you know, diversity is heading down amongst uh, the, you know, top 300 and the UK is going to have to, you know, they've given them six years or something to start to put in, you know, self mandated quotas in the corporate world. And it's not happening. And then as yep. again, in some areas it's declined. What's been your observations, both good and bad. Um, and, and, you know, just what, what have you seen? I mean, it, it, it proves unequivocally, that diverse boards, particularly those that have over a certain percentage of, of females perform better um, just based on the, you know, the, the way the dynamics work. What's been your observation uh, over your career and what you've seen and both good and bad? Um, well, certainly to, to concur with what you, what you were saying, uh, the majority of ch uh, charity boards are, you know, male about two thirds uh, male and mm. um, almost all maybe in the fifties, certainly in their sixties, maybe in their seventies. Um, and, and that, that and, and from a generally from a more professional background and, and with you know, people with time on their hands and so on. So it tends to be a bit self-selecting and that, uh, and we've already talked about um, uh, the recruitment process that then can go on for decades and decades and just reproducing itself. Yeah. Um, I think the, the 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 challenge, of course, is that if you have a more diverse board, uh, you will have more disagreement and uh, a more challenge. 
and it is more difficult, uh, even though the, the quality of the decision that comes out, I believe, will be higher. And um, if, if you are volunteering your time to do this, um, lots of people actually don't want the hassle. They want things to be easy. And, um, <clears throat> and, and so there's, a, there's a, 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 a tension there. And I think one of the, one of the things we need to be looking at is, uh, is, not just, is not just how do we increase the diversity of the board, which great as that target is, I think there's, there's other, we need to understand what's stopping that diversity. And uh, I think one of the things is that we tend to load um, liabilities and responsibilities on a trustee, um, some of which aren't actually totally uh, true, but the perception is, and, uh, and so it can put people off. And uh, we require uh, the board to be made up of people who are signed up to be trustees. Why? Why, why, why does the board... Why isn't the board five trustees and five co-opted people who haven't got that much time, but are all in their 30s and are all having busy jobs and could contribute to, you know, there, there's other ways. There's other ways of looking at the structure of a board and that can be more inclusive for people who are not retired, who have a day job, who have other interests. And uh, so I think looking at those the structures, the, the systems that, you know, that create that, that charity board culture, and saying, how do we make it more accepting? Uh, why don't we run a board where, you know, why doesn't the board meet, meet you know, fairly infrequently, but there are other sub-teams that are meeting. Don't have to be trustees. Those don't have to be people signed up to, you know, we can, we can focus, just bring somebody in to focus on a particular topic. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that, that's, that's a different, uh, a different mindset. That's kind of looking at it and saying, well, it doesn't have to be the way it's always been. So, um, so, so, you know, the whole issue of diversity yeah. is around decision making, decision making, getting the right people there. What are, what are we currently doing, which is stopping the right people coming on that bus? And what yeah. can we do to, to, to reduce those barriers and make it easier for people to contribute? Yeah, I think you've, you've nailed it. And I think the hardest thing in any for anyone, for any human, is having the self awareness enough to be able to ah. say, you know, you know, here's here's what, um, you know, he, here's the challenges. I'm a part of the challenge. I'm either going to step aside or I, I've got to play a role in in changing it. And that's you know, hence why the data, you know, because it's really hard to say, you know, what I'm only performing six out of ten. You know, I'm not great at this because that's hard for a lot of humans to admit. You know, or, or conflict is great in the boardroom because it the friction produces these these eight outcomes. And you know, and, and when the diversity predisposes to you know a lifelong habit of of way of doing things, you know, it's going to be hard to change. And you know, uh, you know, I, I remember when when the diversity call out happened about two years ago, and the Reddit CEO said, "You know what? I'm not going to be a part of the problem anymore." He sat down, put put. Um, uh, uh, a black American in his place, you know, mm. not enough white, there was too many white CEOs that are leading corporate companies. And, you know, that's a, that's a big deal to do something like that in terms of, you know, and that takes a lot of self-awareness. <clears throat> um, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, this is where I see the role of technology playing a role, particularly if we start, you know, I mean, actually, I'm interested in your view on this as we wrap this up, you know, do 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 self evaluations do board evaluations start mm. that are done more regularly, highlight this, right, particularly if you start using data. And, and you know, some of the, the areas that I see a lot in the future of boardroom technology is the for, future of boardroom data, board and, and data led governance, you know, does this start to drive change by proxy of of you know holding a mirror up to you know what has largely been you know just a, a recreation of the same thing over the last however many years so um i guess yeah do you do you agree with that view you, you made a very very interesting point there about self-awareness and um and you know, there's three layers isn't it you have to be self-aware then aware of others before you can actually get the team to work together so mm. self-awareness and being open to that is 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 quite critical and that is is, is critical and the coaching and the counseling to, to enable that 
that's that's one story. Um, yeah, with regard to holding a mirror up to the board, um, two ways of doing this, self-assessment and externally facilitated assessment. Um, self-assessment is better than nothing. It can be good, but what I would challenge, so one of the areas you might ask questions on, for example, mm. is um, is how does the how does the board score on integrity? Yeah. And are you honestly telling me that anybody on that board is going to score themselves down on integrity? Come on, is that it's yeah. not going to happen? Um, and uh, and uh, and actually, this is this is again another live. Is, is I've just uh, reviewed uh, an, a self assessment of of a of a board and looked at. Oh, this is very positive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it is quite, you know, doesn't really challenge and doesn't open up the uh, the real issues. And externally facilitated review however <laughs> will ask the difficult questions and will um, bring out the um, the issues and uh, and i think an interesting point so one of the ways that i do a, um, a governance board review is that uh, I'll, I'll collect you know data quantitative and qualitative data through talking with the trustees but also talking with the exec yeah. And as you as you gather that 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 that, um, that you know the, the data from those from those conversations, you could then play it back as data, and uh, if you can show the difference in views between those two groups, and the difference in views within those two groups, as data, then the it drives out the emotion of those uh, of the, That's of right. the discussion. And, well, it's and very, that, it's and very that, similar that enables to... you to have a proper, meaningful conversation. Of, yeah. Ah, right. That's the yeah, exactly. Can... I mean, it, it, you know, for my career, we've always done a self-evaluation and then the 360-degree evaluation, and you look at the gaps between it, right? Mm. You And, and I, you know, my question is, is in, in, for my limited experience is why is this not being done at a board level you particularly if all of these people have corporate backgrounds like you'd often rate yourself on you know ability to to, to to lead a motivated team you know and then what does the actual team think of your ability to lead a motivated team and you know and and, and you know a lot you often probably rate yourself better and you, and you take the middle ground between it and use it as an action or an outcome uh you know why why is that so hard to do at a board level <clears throat> particularly within a charity uh, charity sector there is perhaps there's a, a, a mindset here uh, this um if if you if if you if you if you were to really examine um the the mindset the underlying assumptions of trustees uh, would you i think maybe you would you'd expose a a mindset of i'm a volunteer Therefore, anything I do is good. Mm -hmm. uh, it's okay not to be, you know, um, uh, you know, I'm I'm doing the best job I can. Therefore, that's uh, that's 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 enough. Yeah. And yeah. Um, and there's there's one when I when I work with with trustees and boards, there's a there's what there's a question that um, I ask of them that helps I think to address that particular issue was uh, and it's around that you know the role of the trustee is you know you are entrusted with the assets but you're only entrusted with the assets for a limited time you know your terms yeah. of reference at some point you are going to hand them over right yeah. so it's the parable of the talents and the question is uh, at the end of your tenure what kind of charity are you going to hand back yeah what's your legacy hand, <laughs> what's your legacy yeah. Is it to hand back a safe charity or a better charity? And yeah. if it's a better charity, then these issues of um, of you know external assessment, self assessment, being honest with yourself, those are absolutely critical because you will not yeah. hand back a better organisation unless you're prepared to do that. So, yeah. question for you as a trustee: What's going to be your personal legacy? Legacy, and you know how will you actually make sure that's delivered? Great, it's got to be in every interview question, doesn't it? But. Um... Nigel, that has been amazing. I've really enjoyed our conversation. Uh, for everyone that's watching this, uh, you'll, you'll you have Nigel's details for the charity leadership and trustee, uh, charity leaders and trustee fellowship. Uh, we'll be posting that alongside the video. Uh, you can contact Nigel via that. Uh, I think it's been amazing. I hope I've learned a lot. Just just 
you know, navigating, you know, what is, I think, a really interesting space. And we're going through an interesting time in terms of the role that boards need to play for their stakeholders and their shareholders. Um, thank you very much. And um, I hope you enjoyed it, uh, enjoyed our conversation today. Ben, it's been, it's been great. It's been a, been a, a joy to have the conversation. Uh, and uh, Claudia, if there's anything else I can do to help, if there's materials you want me to uh, you know, provide you with, then give me a shout. Love to.